Hello, and welcome to my talk, The Future of Teaching. So maybe this is not exactly like the future of all teaching, but this is how I envision the future of our teaching. So maybe I can reflect on some of the uh, basic points here. So we're talking about some of the less obvious innovations of code refinery and things that I think that everyone should be doing. So some disclaimers. So this is focused on like practical teaching. So if you give lectures or dump information or something like that, maybe this will be less interested, interesting to you. So like to say this again, the point is we're teaching something and then our learners are following along and trying it while we are, um, like while we're teaching. So everything here is my opinions. I think other people share them, but um, anything that you disagree with is my fault. Anything you agree with was developed by the community. And this is formed over years of teaching these kind of courses, both in person and for the last year and a half, or I guess almost two years now, online. And whenever I say absolute statements, like everyone must be doing this, that's mostly dramatic effect. So I realized that everything's a balance. But let's be, um, let's, let's make it sound interesting. So before we can go too far, we have to talk about the role of teaching. So, yeah. So I think that we've been held back by the idea that teaching needs to be very interactive, or more precisely, the way the interactivity is. So when I thought about this, I, could, I have thought of three different categories. So one is like one-on-one -on -one or small group mentoring. Like you're sitting next to the person in your office and the person's helping you while you're doing something. Then is interactive courses. So let's say like 20 or 30 people. And this is what people consider to be interactive normally. Like you ask a question and you expect the audience to go answering you and saying something and you have the time to walk around and talk to everyone and so on. And then let's get to very large. So um, like MOOC like, so when you might have hundreds or more people in there with of course the subclasses recorded or text material available because in these you aren't really expecting individual interaction with anyone. So I think that technology has allowed the last one, the MOOC like courses to become much better than before. And that's basically a lot of what I'm talking about. And I really think that the first of these, the mentoring, and the last one, the MOOC courses, are squeezing out the room for the middle courses in here. So basically, as you'll see, we found ways to make the MOOC courses more interactive. So that way we don't need these middle-sized labor-intensive courses and can have large courses and then the small group mentoring. Then let's talk about learning styles. So not everyone... Um, can learn immediately during the course. And especially when we have these middle-sized courses, we're expecting everyone to be doing things right then uh, while you're talking. And if you aren't, then you're basically taking a seat from someone else. So I think that we can do better in supporting these people that are watching and learning later, or can just passively attend and get used to how things work and they might come back later. And again, we're gonna see that these strategies support these other learning styles better. And I mentioned the role of mentoring before. So this is something that I think we need to improve more. So we need to improve these, um, like this post-teaching mentoring later. Okay, so let's get to our innovations. So first off, let's look here. This is some of the feedback we got from a course. Uh, this is the May, summer 2021 uh, Kickstart course where we used most of these techniques we've seen below. And as you can read there, the person was pretty happy with the output. And this is even half a year ago, and we've done a lot of development since then. Okay, let's get going. So online. Everyone was forced to go online last year. I think that we've been more successful than most in doing this. Um, and almost everything you see that I'm going to talk about was made possible by being online. And also, um, 
we made them online more interactive than usual. Okay, so first off, co-teaching. So once I said something, I don't know if this is the exact quote, but I just realized, okay, I'm done with teaching alone. Like it's too much work and there's a better way to do this. So I think every lesson should be arranged with at least two co-teachers, not alternating in sections. Like you do section one, I do section two, but basically made as a discussion between people. So basically in a large or in a medium class, you're expecting like you say something and you expect the learners to interact and answer your questions and so on. But that doesn't scale to MOOC level courses. And to be honest, it barely scales to these medium sized courses with say 20 people in it. Because I mean, you'll get a few people that are answering everything and then a bunch of people that are not saying anything. And we consider that to be good. So it takes some getting used to, but in the end, by having two co-teachers co and basically designing the course as a conversation between these people. So there's different advantages. So first off, it reduces the teaching load. If you ever don't know what to say, give a pause and the other person will speak up. Um, it provides this built-in interaction. So depending on the material, there's different ways of doing this. Like here in this Kickstart course, you see it's me and my colleague teaching and the way it was working at this time. So basically I was typing stuff and my colleague was sort of explaining what to type and the big picture. And this was just very powerful and keeps people much more engaged, I think. So you'll see many different links to the code refinery manuals that explain our um, hints at doing this kind of thing. Okay. Next is HackMD for communication. So in the large courses, if you ask someone to speak, no one's going to. I mean, you just don't speak when there's hundreds of people there and it's being recorded. Also, um, using the text chat doesn't really work because first off, there's people's names there again. Second off, it's a linear thing. And then as soon as you type something, it just scrolls away and is gone. So we've got HackMD. Um, yeah. So here, the basic idea is we have questions that are answered in a bullet point and then multiple answers in sub bullet points. And they can sort of carry on as a discussion. So here we see there's questions, there's some that are waiting to be answered. And in practice, we have multiple helpers that are sitting here and just waiting to make the answers as people as we are teaching. During question and answer time, we'll share the hack and D just like this. And then you will like we'll be able to see as people are writing questions and answer them. So it's basically feels to to the learner, it feels a lot like you're raising your hand in a large lecture and then asking a question, except everyone can do it at the same time. And when it's important, we'll answer. When it's best answered by writing, someone else can answer. And I mean, it's basically just amazing. And then not only that, we can post this after the course, and then there is a permanent record of all of these different questions. So in fact, right here during this lecture, I'm teaching with HackMD. So if you go to the top and switch to the edit mode, you get this view and you can edit. So that's why I'm speaking this way. So basically, while I'm giving my talk, you can also be writing questions and comments directly into here, and I will be answering. So I'm demonstrating my, um, like I'm, I'm self-demonstrating the techniques I'm teaching. So if, you, if anyone has a comment, just please edit my slides as I'm talking, and I will answer and discuss. Okay, so this is something which courses just need to do. Okay. And then after the above, we can start getting many helpers. So if it's online, and if we have HackMD for answering questions, it's easy for basically all of, the, all of my colleagues who don't have something more important to do, they can join the course and open HackMD and start answering questions even while they're doing their other work or whatever else. 
So, um, yeah. Um, this is a, yeah. So this is something that's made possible for, by being online. Yes, okay. And we have a training for exercise leaders here. Although actually that should be in something else, like in a different section, I think. Okay, then is portrait screen sharing. So you notice that I am sharing my screen vertically like this. So I think that the like full HD, the uh, like landscape screen sharing is practically speaking obsolete by now. So in almost all cases, it's better to share the screen vertically like this because that's how we work anyway. Like we, we rarely have one window which we keep open, um, like open, um, like taking up our whole screen. We're doing multiple things at once. And the same with the learners. So we need some of the learner screen space for our screen share and the learner needs some of their screen space for doing their own work. In things like this, which are not hands-on work, but talking, I think it doesn't hurt anyway. I mean, basically you can be listening to me and doing your own work at the same time. Why make it harder and you have to flip back and forth? I mean, let's be honest, you're gonna be looking at other stuff at the same time anyway. This also forces you to keep your screen sharing simple um, and as an instructor, you have the other half available for your own chat and notes and things like that. So if you look down, like here's the example of the vertical screen share. So we've arranged it. So the top is the uh, lesson we're sharing. The bottom is where we're actually demonstrating the work. And finally, there's a like shell history here. So you can see what is going on. Okay, um, if you share ha HackMD in the screen share, that like all the time, unlike what you see here, it's even better because then the learners will know that questions are being asked and it's active. Mm, yes, there's a question coming up. Ah, so you can do this under advanced screen sharing options. So, um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Now, teams and breakout rooms. So when we've done code refinery courses, we scale to about 100 or 120 people first. And this is too much to sort of form some sort of community like we wanted in our courses. So our solution is teams. So we pre-assign learners to teams of five or six people, and then we give one helper per team, which basically emphasizes our helper recruitment. Um, each team gets its own breakout room, and most importantly, the teams are the same across the whole courses. So we'll do some teaching in the main room, and then we say, okay, it's an exercise session. And then people get sent to a breakout room. And then they do the exercises with their helpers. We have expert helpers and our instructors will go across and join the different breakout rooms and see what's going on and whatever. So this is very labor intensive for doing the coordination of all of these rooms and helpers and so on, but it has an amazing effect. So on the first day, it might be a little bit quiet, but by the uh, end times, like the end of the course after multiple days, these people really feel connected and are really working together quite well. To make this even better, we have the option to bring your own breakout room. So if a research group joins and they want to learn the skills together, we can put them in the same breakout room with their same helper. So they already know each other. And basically this mentoring relationship that's being made in the breakout room will continue in the everyday work after the course. And yeah, this is something which we should try doing more often, except for the fact that it's difficult. So let's combine this with a next level, which is live streaming. So after the main room, we aren't asking questions in there. We are not uh, doing the exercises in there. We're not expecting learners to say anything. 
why do the learners even need to be able to say anything? Why do they even need to be in Zoom? So Zoom is better for teaching than it was a year and a half ago when the pandemic started, but Zoom is still this big limit. So basically when we use Zoom, we have to keep the access restricted because we're worried about trolls joining. Streaming services can reach everyone. So we can basically separate out the learner interaction in the teams and breakout rooms from the instructing and the communication by HackMD and then live stream all of the instructor side of things. Okay, and yes, and this is, well, our technique here, we basically have one Zoom meeting for only the instructors, and I will capture that with OBS, Open Broadcaster Software, and then stream that via Twitch. Okay, so in the future, I really emphasize the live streaming and these big audiences. Okay. So let's look at our general MOOC strategy. Here's the big diagram. So we have this private instructor Zoom, like I said. We capture it and stream it with OBS. It goes to different sources. There might be a MOOC audience, which is just watching and has no interaction with us. There's recording. There is a learner Zoom uh, where some of the learners can be in a room and here we manage the teams and the exercise leaders and so on. Um, and then the questions and other things flow back via HackMD or an instructor check. So how do instructors know how well it's going in the team and exercise rooms? So surprisingly, like you might think this is a big worry, but it's not too hard. So basically we have the questions via HackMD. So once we start having a huge number of questions there, you can sort of see what struggles people are having. And then the, um, since this is online, we're not limited to the two instructors that are co-teaching. We have this whole other set of people, like our expert helpers, basically. So they're in the instructor Zooms and checking things out and monitoring, and they're reporting back via the chat or even HackMD and telling us, okay, things are going okay, you need more time, adjust this, and so on. So it's sort of like specialization. So instructors just teach and the, all the helpers monitor the learners and then they communicate. And it really works pretty well. Um, yeah. Okay. I think we will talk about this a little bit later also. So then we get distributed registration. So after we're live streaming, the people that are running the course don't even need to know everyone that's watching it. So they can try to make a registration to send emails to people, but for all practical purposes, the teams and breakout rooms can be handled by the local, um, like local people in some other site. And, um, yeah, so this lets you scale even larger. Okay. Uh, I was getting to this before. So here we're clarifying and separating these different roles. So now we're online, we have these separations. So we can really take advantage of all of these different people together. So we have the instructors who just teach. Uh, during the break time, they don't have to go worry about um, like checking on the learners and things like that. They can actually like mute the live stream and then discuss among themselves about what they want to do next. And their instructors have said that this actually becomes much more easier than teaching other ways, even when you aren't able to see the learners yourselves. There should be some host, which basically does the people management, the registration, the breakout rooms, like the introduction of things and so on. There's a director for tech management. There's helpers. So basically, um, they can be around and do everything. There's a person who's dedicated to the HackMD to keeping it formatted well. And of course, the learners. Um, 
So some of these roles can be combined, but I would be careful. So for example, I've learned that an instructor should try to not be, like it's better if instructors just teach and have no other worries. So the times that I've been teaching in a day and doing the tech management and doing the some of the hosting stuff, like the introduction of the day, that's not too fun. But if you don't do that, it can work out pretty well. So yeah, so we should basically try this and we'll see that this becomes much more easier. And this specialization of the different skills can be applicable even for other courses. I mean, get help and it becomes easier. That's the magic of doing things online. Okay, recordings. So yeah, so now we've done live stream and we have recordings. Um, these recordings allow the learners to Okay, yeah. so first off, we have guaranteed privacy. So since there's no learners in the instructor Zoom room and live stream, you don't have to do an extensive processing to make sure that no one has spoken or turned on their camera at some time or something like that. So you basically can post the recordings immediately. And once you can do that, then learners can review and catch up later um, at their own pace. Um, if they miss a day, then not everything is lost. They can watch and see. And then after the course, you can go along and just follow and um, do the course. Um, yeah, so I think it's basically obsolete to do courses without having recordings available. I mean, why lose this information? There's so many different benefits to it as long as privacy can be guaranteed. And yeah. Okay, free flowing materials. So this is again, a self demonstrating thing. So this is a presentation and I have free flowing scrolling material. Um, it's arguable if this is a good idea in this kind of presentation, but I think it's important for these sort of hands on courses because learners need to be able to open this also and use it like a reference document, not like slides which are being flipped through. Um, yeah, but this is something we're still working on. Actually, I have this tool, Sphinx MiniPres, which can turn a Sphinx site into basically a presentation. Um, but this, these things are still being worked on. And apparently the section is also being worked on because I didn't finish it. Okay, something you need to do, define your audience well once you get to large courses. So you need to set clear expectations about um, what, um, who, who you expect to attend and what prerequisites are and what happens if you don't have those prerequisites, what you can get. Also, now that we're doing this, these massive courses, it's okay if someone that comes and doesn't meet the prerequisites. They're no longer taking a seat away from someone else who will get more out of it. Okay. Uh, yes. So we're getting to the point where I will be summarizing these a bit more because you can read as well as I can speak. Okay. Then backwards lesson design. So everything we teach, um, we need to carefully consider not what do I want people to know, but what does the learner need to know? And this is some sort of major trap in a lot of teaching. So we'll, we, we'll go and we'll teach people what we would do, but not what we did five or 10 or 20 years ago when we were first learning this topic. We teach perfection, not good enough and the next stage in the learning process. And for this, we really need to do backwards lesson design. So we need to think what will the person be able to do at the end and design around that. Oh, and we should add to this. Maybe someone else can do that. We should add that the lessons need to be reviewed and discussed among multiple instructors. So basically start preparing and um, then get feedback early. Otherwise we get things which may not be useful to many people. Okay, installation help. So when you're doing something that is hands-on, 
installation is critical because it will like if people come and they're not ready to take part then it slows everything down and in a course with 20 people maybe you can go and help the couple of people and get going and not take too long but whenever it's 100 people if anyone is not ready then you basically can't stop and slow down um but by adopting some sort of defense in depth strategy we've eliminated a lot of these problems and things work remarkably well oh another great thing about being online is that you can have installation help sessions in advance of the actual workshop so basically um have people come by and verify and get the help okay good use of screen sharing so at any point the screen shares should always answer the question of where are we so like we are here i'm trying to adjust my mouse pointer to point at roughly what i am talking about during things like breaks and so on you should be explicit about where we are so break until this time the exercises until this time and here's what you should be able to do um yeah try to make sure the headings are visible at all times so people can find where they are include the hackmd so learners know it's active and that questions are being added to it um clever use of screen sharing also makes it easier to process videos later which i've learned as i have been processing lots of things here's an example of a screen shared during a exercise session so this is the hackmd which is being shared there's clear instructions with a direct link to where the exercises are, the uh, effort someone should do, so basically how much, um, like what they should and shouldn't be able to do. This is an interesting feature here. We use HackMD as a bar graph. So um, people add another character here to um, indicate what they've been able to do. And of course, during these exercises, the HackMD Q&A continues. Okay, next is design public first. So this idea of, oh, this should be private because it might not be ready yet, just don't do that. So start it as a public thing. You can have disclaimers saying this is still under development and so on, but make it as open as possible. The effort of keeping it private just really isn't worth it. Okay, breaks. When you're doing anything longer than an hour, breaks are not negotiable and should be a minimum of 10 minutes. Five minutes is not enough. Don't combine them with other things. And most importantly, design the lesson around the breaks, not the other way around. This is a big tra trap that happens quite often. Um, yes. Okay, feedback. Always ask for feedback. It should be immediate and anonymous. Asking by voice won't get you the answers that you need. If you ask, am I going too fast or too slow? Who wants to really answer that kind of thing where everyone will hear? But it's easy to make a quick hack and poll like you saw above. Say, we're going about right, too fast, too slow, and people can answer there. Um, I mean, HackMD is great, so you don't get just questions, but you get feedback. Either explicit, like, this is too confusing, go slow, fast, or um, by seeing the questions people are writing, then you can see what's going on. At the end of every lesson, we ask two questions. So I guess this could actually say we end with two good questions. So of the day, name one good thing. Oops, uh, I clicked a button on my mouse. That's not very good. Okay, yeah. So at the end of every lesson, we ask, um, name, we ask people to say one good thing that you learned and one thing that could be improved. So perhaps not everyone does it, but it's definitely a start. Okay, 
post-workshop surveys are always useful. And I think one thing we should do more of is giving each other feedback as instructors. So here's some other minor recommendations, like the course or live stream should always start early and always go after the time. So before is first off a title card, but then also starting 10 or 15 minutes before, we have this co-instructor chat and icebreakers where we basically get people used to the HackMD and the tools and the instructors are chatting about what we think is going to happen and ask some questions. Um, yeah. Uh, and then afterwards, we basically don't stop at the end. We keep the discussion going in the live stream and people can keep like writing stuff there. Um, let's see. We need, always need to demonstrate how to interact and ask questions. So um, I have a feeling some of my colleagues had seeded some of the first HackMD questions up there so people would see how it works. Keep unredistributed material out of the stream. So basically don't go sharing YouTube videos or things like that. I mean, the basic rule in my mind, if it's not Creative Commons licensed, it doesn't exist. Um, yeah. And you can find plenty more in our manuals, which are always under development. So for the future, not everything is perfect. So my big takeaways. So I would like more partnerships. So now that we can scale to a large audience and online is the standard, we should work together more. That not only provides um, shared effort in these massive courses, but also there can be many more of these specialist courses going on. I think Code Refinery is a good platform for this. Uh, Code Refinery was a Nordic organization focused on producing practical hands-on teaching material for researchers who need to use programming. It is continued for another three years in a sustainability phase, and our goal is to make it a community project. Okay, um, let's see. Instructor training. So Code Refinery has an instructor training. If you ask me, it's sort of been trying to figure out what its role is. So my vision is that we can expand this instructor training and it becomes something not just for dedicated teachers, like people who are teaching as a main part of their job, but I think there's many different technical staff who know like these various specialized topics and need to teach them. And we can provide an instructor training for these people and basically help them use all of these strategies to get closer to the idea that everyone is a teacher and everyone is a mentor. Okay, make the streaming setup simpler. So here you can see my home office during the uh, Python for Scientific Computing course. And this is sort of a bit gratuitously complex. So I've done it in simpler ways before, but I was just kept trying to expand to see how easy I could make it for myself. But this is just too complex. Like it's not feasible to get other people to do this kind of thing, as fun as it may sound but I really think it can be simplified a lot. So my goal is to make it possible with one laptop for, um, for the broadcasting and one computer for each instructor as they're speaking. And I think it's doable and we just need time to work on it, which hopefully we can do during a hackathon we'll have in January, 2021. Okay, instructor evaluation process. So I think there can be a better way to give feedback to um, us as instructors. Like we should be more open about commenting to each other. Then subtitles. So somehow subtitles have become a proxy for accessibility. Well, not somehow via EU regulations. But the effect I've basically seen is that we should release fewer videos because, because we can't do them perfectly. So basically the perfect has become uh, the enemy of the better. So I think we're already far better than before. Instead of giving a course in a room and then it just going away immediately, and if you can't listen to us, there's nothing, 
we can put them on YouTube and they get automatic subtitles, which are really pretty good for when I've reviewed them. But can we make it better? So I believe that Twitch and OBS have some sort of support for real-time subtitles, but we need someone to figure out how this works. So let's see, what are my conclusions? So I think that in-person teaching is almost obsolete. This is one of my absolute statements, so of course it's not really true. But I think that in the future we'll have like t uh, mentoring kind of things in person, and then the teaching online using a lot of these strategies. I think Zoom is basically not good enough. Mm. I mean, it's good enough for small things, but it's hard to get this recording, these recordings out of it, and we're losing a big part of it. And also the restricted access things. Um, and by working together, we can reach more people, have more interactivity, take better advantage of a wide variety of helpers, have a better helper onboarding process, so get people started in an easy way and then move up, and then have more specialized courses, and also have more fun networking together and working with each other. Okay, so now we see the Q&A here. Um, so I think that four people is not that many. So our team is, uh, 10 people, and before a course would take two or three people going there and sitting there. But now it's easier for someone to work, to do the course in addition to their other job. So someone doesn't have to go to a dedicated room and then be limited by what else they do. So we have our colleagues which join for the times and days that they don't have other meetings or leave to other meetings or even like do something else in the background while you're listening to the lecture. Uh, by doing it online, we can combine sites across different, um, like different organizations and countries. That helps us to get four people even easier. Um, let's see. Uh, so once you consider these, the break-even points gets a little bit lower. So. I have to say, we haven't done these live streaming courses with a very small number of people. So every time we've done them, we've gotten, say, 50 to 100 people signing up. So that four people is definitely worth it. Um, yeah. Okay, let's consider break-even format. So in our previous efforts, we might be teaching to a room of 30 people with uh, two instructors, or say one instructor and one helper. So that would mean that um, 50 or 60 people is a break-even format, not even considering that it's easier to take part and takes less time from each helper. Okay, we're all written material in these courses. So personally, I'm of the opinion that we should make material so it's good for both the standalone reviewing and working in this online teaching. So it's not worth our time to try to make two things at once. And this really does take a mindset um, change. So I'm, I'm not sure what the best practices are. Like I think it's still being developed. Um, it's something that I haven't thought about a lot if you look at some of our material, you can see the different strategies we use. But I think the main thing that I consider, so I accept that the material may not be perfect for the uh, presentation in order to make it more useful when someone is reviewing it later themselves. That's my general trade-off, I think. Okay, credits is actually an interesting point of view. So actually when we're doing it live stream, so we can have the live stream that's open and then a Zoom meeting. So, okay, if you want credits, okay, no. So one group of people gives the live stream. If you want credits, there's a registration and then we can make a Zoom meeting there, which the instructors don't need to know about. And in that Zoom meeting, they take attendance, they see that people are there they can go to the breakout rooms and see that people are active and actually doing things. 
Um, giving credits during a peer live stream course is a bit difficult. So we've thought of things like having some surveys, which should be done during the course to show that someone is actually active there. Like you have to be watching because at some point the instructors will say, okay, here is a um, questionnaire. If you want credits, you need to go answer this in the next five minutes. And then they go and they answer. But also this is sort of the, um, let's see, I call it the presence versus engagement fallacy. So in a big lecture of 500 people, just forcing people to go sit there, they're present, but does that mean they're actually engaged in the course and learning anything? Not necessarily. I mean, especially these days, there's so many distractions. So I think we really need to think about, are we giving credits for being present somewhere? Or are we giving credits for being engaged in something? And we need to create this local engagement via the mentoring aspects and the small groups and so on. And then that will somehow give the credits. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's something that I think that we will keep working on next year. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, the first sent sentence from moving from the basic PowerPoint Zoom to our model. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think that Zoom is one of the last things to go. So um, like the live stream things is at the very end. So having the breakout rooms and the vertical screen sharing and the um, like HackMD, these are all pretty easy to mix and match and start adding to it. Actually, at some point, um, can someone go to the code refinery manuals and find the, um, I think there's an online teaching strategy which gives steps one, two, and three. And there's two A, two B, and two C. And you can paste that there. And that sort of gives some of my thoughts on the matter. Okay, uh, so the five to six person per team and four instructors. So in code refinery where we've done the teams, there's the instructors. And then, um, and actually four instructors is sort of low for that. So code refinery is um, six half days with two lessons per day. And these days it's our standard that we might have, say, maybe I'd say six to 10 instructors because it's so easy for someone to come by and teach just one part of it and then be the helper for the other parts. So, okay, yeah. So the four people doesn't include the helpers in the breakout rooms. So when we have people sign up for the course in our registration form, we have the options. I'm signing up for live stream, as in I'm not going to attend any kind of Zoom. I'm signing up as a learner and I will um, like, try to be learning things and I'm signing up as a helper, which means I'm probably still learning things. Actually, we use the term exercise leader now to emphasize that the helper will also be learning and doesn't have to know everything. And these exercise leaders get a training the week before the course, um, which hmm, actually that should be added above, I think. So they get an exercise leader training and then um, we like teach them the basics of the mentoring and how to keep a good, um, a good breakout room going. And then these are the people that go to each breakout room. And we need some pretty active recruiting here. Like we, we need to really try hard to get these people coming. But so far it's basically worked and we've gotten enough and it's been okay. And the exercise leaders aren't alone because our instructors and expert helpers were rotating throughout the rooms to basically um, keep them working well. So the leader is more like a facilitator. Yes, okay. Yeah, these are great questions here. So maybe I'll give one or two more minutes 
to answer these and um, then I will stop the recording and we can have a true Zoom discussion here. Okay, so please ask. Okay, well, I'm not seeing much, so I will mm, stop the recording. Thanks to everyone who watched.